Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I work here in Author Events, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to introduce Ben Winters. Uh, praised by the Cleveland Plain Dealer for the, quote, bare-boned, raw, and honest Last Policeman trilogy, a pre-apocalyptic noir series in which a detective investigates a murder even as a looming asteroid collision promises to end most or all of life on Earth. Uh, for this work, he won the Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America and the Philip K. Dick Award for Distinguished Science Fiction. More on Philip K. Dick in a moment. Uh, among other honors, and was on Slate, NPR, and Amazon's yearly best of lists. His other work includes the genre mashing and smashing New York Times bestseller Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, the middle grade novels The Mystery of Missing Everything, and The Secret Life of Miss Finkelman. Uh, and he is also the author of several plays and musicals for children and adults. Um, in Underground Airlines, Ben imagines a nightmarish alternate history in which the Civil War was never fought, allowing slavery to still exist in 21st century America. Think Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle meets Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man. The esteemed novelist Ann Patchett said this about Underground Airlines. This one kept me up at night and changed the way I saw the world once I was finished. Uh, it's high praise. Uh, here to tell you more about it, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Ben Winters to the Free Library of and Philadelphia. Thank you to those listening um, on live stream. I understand they're live streaming this, and it'll be available on podcasts. So thank you to all people listening in whatever format, uh, whenever you are listening. Um, so I'm going to uh, first just talk for a little bit, and then I will read for a little bit and then I might talk some more, and you should feel free after I'm done with the reading and the talking to ask questions. Um, I look forward to that portion of the evening. Um, so I think what I'm going to do, uh, and Jason informed you a little bit about what this book is, is talk a little bit about how I came to write the book by, means of setting, uh, by way of setting up the reading portion. Um, so as he said, my previous set of novels, I wrote this trilogy, called The Last Policeman Trilogy, um, in which my hero is a young uh, police detective in Concord, New Hampshire, who is uh, persisting in his business of solving murders, despite the fact that the world is going to end in about 10 months due to a giant asteroid that's going to collide with the planet. Uh, and I will confess to you that when I thought of this idea, I was like, oh, cool, that's an awesome idea. In other words, I thought of it very much as this will be a really neat, clever, crafty idea for a detective novel. Uh, in other words, in more other words, this, will be, this is a plot-driven idea that I had. But once I started working on it, on what would become a trilogy of novels about this character, continuing to persist in his work even as the uh, world comes closer and closer to destruction, and by the last book, which is called World of Trouble, it's two weeks out before the asteroid collides, and he's trying to solve this, this one mystery before the world ends, I realized early on in the process that I had sort of stumbled onto a much bigger idea, a sort of existential question about why any of us do anything. What is the point of this guy solving murders, right? It's crazy. What's the point of him doing this? The world is about to end. And then I realized, well, why are any of us doing anything, right? What's the point? Why do we order our lives the way we do? Why do we make and keep promises? Why do we trust? Why do we build lives? Why do we love? Why do we commit ourselves to things? Why do we go to work every day, right? We're all facing an asteroid. So I was like, oh, well, that's really interesting. And I think the extent to which those books, um, I guess sort of uh, uh, put me on the map, or that's a terrible metaphor for a professional writer, but the extent to which th those books landed with people and I won those awards that he mentioned, it sort of um, was because it was, it ended up being more than just, oh, cool, what an interesting idea, what a clever plot, but rather I sort of tunneled into something. I found something that, that mattered to me, that resonated with me, and then I think hopefully resonated with readers. But then I had, I finished those books, because one thing about, if you're gonna write um, a series where the world ends at the end, you realize that's not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to continue it indefinitely. Um, uh, I, I was thinking about what I was going to do next. And meanwhile, I am an American and living in America in um, 2011, 12, 13, 14. And 
Um, like so many Americans, I was increasingly horrified and distressed by a series of, of very high-profile incidents of African Americans facing police violence um, or quasi-police violence, um, self-appointed neighborhood vigilante violence in the case of Trayvon Martin. Um, and then, uh, you know, you know the cases that I'm talking about, of Tamir Rice in Cleveland and Eric Garner in Staten Island, and then, of course, Michael Brown in Ferguson, and the names multiply and continue and continue up to last week um, with Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. And like so many people, I found myself obviously deeply distressed, but also asking why? Why does this keep happening? What is going on? Um, how can it be? How can it be that we're in the year 2011, 12, 13, 14, and these sorts of things are still happening? Um, and then as you, as one thinks more about it, it is impossible to imagine that these incidents are somehow isolated, right? That, that um, the things that we read about in the newspaper are all that is happening, and there are things that can be solved by body cams, you know? That as if, I guess, I, I wondered more and more about the systematic roots of, of these um, incidents. Um, and so I started thinking about institutional racism, and I started thinking about the history of institutional racism. Um, and it got me thinking about slavery, because I started to notice, I think, that when we have our sort of periodic national conversation about race, you know, which by the way, like, I think that the people who are affected by these incidents and by the pervasive institutional racism of which they are the tip of the iceberg are always having this conversation because they have to, and it only becomes a national conversation about race when the rest of us um, stop to think about it for a minute. But it struck me that the kinds of things we were talking about, like body cameras um, on police dashboards or whatever, uh, they leave out, very often, leave out a conversation about slavery, about the fact that this country was founded as a slave state, that certain people were bought and sold, and that in the um, institution building foundational years of this country and for many generations afterward, um, a large portion of the population was locked out of power and locked out of the conversation. And that those facts didn't uh, simply go away magically um, with emancipation or with the civil rights movement or with the Civil Rights Act or with the election of President Obama, that we have a lineage can be traced a legacy from slavery to the present day. Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to describe is that the two things sort of were both going on um, in my mind, right, as a, as, a, as a writer and as a human being, that I had realized that I had this, this interest professionally in using um, the mystery thriller detective genre, which I so love, in which I fear I have a, a you know a talent for like a, that's what, where I'm, I where I am as an artist to think about things to to think about things that I care about that are important right and at the same time this is what was turning over in my heart and what I was thinking about a lot in terms of the national um, the country that I live in and the the my fellow Americans to use a, a sort of tarnished phrase um, so those two things came together and I think that's where I ended up at this idea for this novel, which was to take this figurative idea, in a way, slavery is still with us, and make it literal. Slavery is still with us. And ask the reader to imagine that sort of dystopian, nightmarish version of America as a sort of means or mechanism of thinking about the America in which we live. Um, so that was the sort of, I guess, the genesis of the story. That's what started sort of to brew in my head. Um, and then from there, I had to do the things that a novelist does. Um, and I presume, because you are all here, you are people who love novels, but you know that a novel cannot merely be an idea. Um, it cannot merely be a sort of thematic worldview or conceit or... Um, because other, because then it's going to be a 300-page pamphlet, right? Uh, it needs to have a setting. It needs to have a character. It needs to have uh, moving parts. Um, and I realized 
I think pretty early on that although the idea of the novel would be that slavery persists in four southern states, the main setting of the novel would be in the north because, well, for one thing, uh, we were living in Indianapolis at the time I was writing this book, and um, it offered a lot in terms of uh, noirish setting, but also because one of the great themes I became really interested in was, was just complicity, right? Was the way that um, we, we allow ourselves to let things go on that we know are bad and that we know we should do more about, but because they are literally and figuratively distant from us, we, um, we don't do anything about. And I, I started, um, you know, as I was writing, as I was working up this novel, I did a lot of reading about the history of the history of slavery, um, and then the history of um, the post-slavery years. Uh, and um, I was really struck by the ways that uh, Northerners allowed themselves, even Northerners who were self-described abolitionist or um, anti-slavery, allowed themselves that moment of going, "Yeah, but what are you going to do? It's not me. I'm way up here in New York or Rhode Island." And I don't have any slaves, and it's a shame, but you know, political compromises have to be made, the country must endure, what are you gonna do? Um, now, not, not everybody, there were those who were very activist, um, but that theme became extremely striking to me, uh, not just as a sort of interesting piece of the novel, but as something that I think many of us, all of us, I think can or should connect with, is like, what are the things that matter to us and um, what are the things that we know are bad and that we know we should do more about in the world, but that we allow, um, we allow ourselves the luxury of not doing anything about because they are figuratively or literally distant from us. So the novel landed, the main setting landed in Indianapolis and it remained, um, I don't think I really did things in this quite this logical order. That's not really how you write a book where you sit down and go, okay, first setting and write out the setting. I think there was, this is obviously much messier, but I needed to find the main voice, the character who would drive the novel. And I tried out a lot of different things. At a certain point, it was a sort of uh, buddy, no, not a buddy, a two, a two person operation where I had a um, local um, African American police officer who was unwillingly um, teamed up with a white federal marshal who had arrived from out of town. Um, and I think that was me, it was me trying something out. And I think at a certain point I realized the main character had to be the point of view character and it had to be, for this novel to work the way I wanted it to, an African American um, who was himself uh, an escaped slave who had been uh, captured and forced to work as an agent, as an undercover agent for the Federal Marshal Service. Um, because the sort of, in terms of the uh, law and order aspects of the book, the function of the novel is it's a bounty hunter novel. Because in the book, the, um, the, the law as it was during the time of slavery under the Fugitive Slave Act, which was first enshrined in the Constitution and then reaffirmed many times thereafter, was that even in free states, if a uh, runaway slave was um, uh, found, it was the obligation of local law enforcement or quote, all good citizens to turn that person in. And so federal marshals, and this is one of the things that, um, one of the constant sources of tension building up to the Civil War, federal marshals were um, constantly showing up in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or Ohio uh, or New York with warrants for the arrest and recapture of runaway slaves. So my hero, or who's is very much an anti-hero, at least in the, the beginning of the novel, um, is, is such a figure. Although he is himself black, he is uh, sort of working for the devil, very knowingly so. Um, and so there too, there too is th this theme of complicity, of um, what are the things that we do uh, in order to make our own lives bearable um, that, that contribute to evil, to a greater evil, or to wickedness that is done unto others. And the sort of, the motion of the novel, the movement of it, I think what we are really following is this character's um, journey uh, out of that, the box that he has allowed himself to be put into. The most important thing I wanna say about this book, before I read to you a little bit, um, 
And then as I said, I will be very happy to take questions later. But the most important thing I want to say about this book is that although, as I've said, I am a crime writer and my background and my sort of passion, I guess, as an artist is in mystery thriller, is that this book is not me using the historical horror of slavery and the contemporary horror of institutional racism as a backdrop or as a sort of setting for a clever mystery novel. It's the opposite of that or the inverse of that. It's me using the tools of my genre, the sort of mystery and thriller elements that I love so well and that I hopefully know how to use so well as a way of thinking about and illuminating um, the horror of slavery and the horror of contemporary racism. And that's the most important thing for me um, in terms of what I want readers to understand or to know about the book as not just as a story, as a piece of entertainment, but as a sort of cultural object, you know. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, I think I'm not going to read the first chapter uh, because I don't think it's necessarily as representative as I would like it to be. It's it's a it's a bit of a well, it's it's a it's a spy novel in a way. So the first chapter is is a, is a little bit of a game. So I'm going to um, jump ahead a little, and I'm actually going to read you chapters three and four. They're quite short. Don't worry. Um, and I'll just let you know that in the first couple chapters, we have met a man who goes by the name, and he's, he's our a point of view character, he speaks in the I voice, and he goes by the name of Jim Dirksen. And in the first chapter, he has gone to a diner in Indianapolis where he's having dinner with a Catholic priest, a young white Catholic priest named Father Barton. And um, Jim is begging him, begging him to please help to rescue his enslaved wife in Carolina. And Father Barton is saying, no, 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 you've got me all wrong. I don't do that sort of thing. I am not part of the underground airlines. And Jim allows him to go away. Okay, chapter three. At the tail end of our dinner together, while we were tussling over the bill, I lifted Father Barton's wallet. This small and seamless maneuver caused me no difficulty or concern. I had performed the same quick action dozens of times in the past. There he was, poor man, embarrassed by my grief, flustered by my adamance, anxious to escape an emotionally charged moment. It would be a lot to ask in such complicated circumstances to keep track of something so prosaic, so secular as a wallet. In the bathroom, I photographed its contents using a tiny device that attaches to my cell phone. Then I slipped the wallet back into his pocket when I embraced him goodbye. And now, back in the Capital City Crossroads Hotel on 86th Street, with the door locked, with the shades pulled, I opened my laptop and began entering data into the remarkable mapping program I had on there. I entered the addresses of three restaurants and five gas stations he had recently patronized and from which he had helpfully held on to the credit card receipts. I entered the address of his gym, his local branch library, and the sport clips where he got his hair cut. I entered to the Meridian Street address of the restaurant where we had just eaten at his suggestion and that of his parish church at St. Catherine's. I had never been to Indianapolis before, but I had been to lots of other cities, and every city is the same. Neighborhoods and waterways, big roads and side roads, a circle of downtown in the middle, a circle of highway around the perimeter like a dog fence. Rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, black areas, white areas, mixed. CVS and Starbucks, Walmart and town stores. The world is the same everywhere you go. In the north, I should say. The world is about the same in every northern city. I'm a lot less familiar with the south these days. What the mapping software did was turn each of the addresses into a blinking red dot. When I was done with the data entry and could take a look at the map, one of the dots sang out to me right away. It called my name. Most of the other dots were clustered together, centered around the priest's church up there on Meridian Street, uh, up, up there on Meridian and just north of it, along the crowded shopping corridor of 86th Street, a mile or two west of where I was sitting. But this one dot was way, way down in a different part of town. 
It sat at the intersection of 38th and Graceland in a neighborhood the map called Mapleton Fall Creek. All right, I said out loud. Well, all right. I laid a fingertip on that dot as if to feel it, to measure its strength. My name is not Jim Dirksen. Neither is my name Dudley Vincent, the identity under which I'd been staying at the Hilton Garden Inn near the Cleveland, Ohio airport until last night when Mr. Bridge called me and woke me and told me to start packing. Mr. Vincent's driver's license and American Express card had since been cut to pieces, and those pieces were now buried in a construction site dumpster behind a Cleveland shopping mall. I had a lot of names. Or, more precisely, it was my practice at the beginning of a new job to think of myself as having no name at all, as being not really a person at all. A man was missing, that's all. Missing and hiding, and I was not a person but a manifestation of will. I was a mechanism, a device. That's all I was. I looked at the dot on 38th Street. The dot blinked, and I blinked back at the dot. That address had come from a cash machine receipt dated three days ago, Sunday at 4.32 p.m., $200 from a region's bank ATM. I tapped a few more keys, and the laptop whirred to life, accenting my map with the requested demographic information, shading every square block of the city according to its African-American population. When this was done, I sat back and laid my hands flat on the desk on either side of the computer keyboard. The main cluster of dots, representing Father Barton's usual stomping ground, those dots were in pale areas. Blocks with an African-American population of 10% or less, 5% or less. That one dot, dot, though, the one blinking lonesome dot down in Mapleton Fall Creek, that one was singing a different song. It wasn't in the darkest part of the map. That was a six square block area just northwest of downtown. That would be Friedman Town, I figured. But the area where Father Barton had taken out 200 bucks on Sunday afternoon, there was some pigmentation down there, no question about it. I whistled very softly, still sitting motionless, hands still flat on the table. All right, I whispered. All right, all right, all right. Chapter four. At 9.49 p.m., I stood from the wobbly wooden desk and stretched, raising my hands until they grazed the low ceiling of the hotel room. I felt around in the coat I had taken off and found a pack of babas, tapped it on the edge of the desk, peeled off the foil, and took out a single cigarette. At exactly 9.50, my cell phone rang. It always rang at 9.50 exactly. Hello? Good evening, Victor, said the voice on the other end, low and even. How is your progress? That's what Mr. Bridge always said, every time. When a case was on, when a file was active, he always called at 9.50, and his voice always sounded the same. She's doing great, thanks, I said. How's your mother? Mr. Bridge didn't laugh. He never laughed. He repeated himself, how is your progress? So far, so good. I slipped out onto the little balcony. The room was on the second floor, and I could smell the bitter fumes of the parking lot. To be honest with you, it would be a lot better if I had the full file. You will. So you've said. I lit the baba and took a drag. Janice will post the full file by tomorrow noon at the absolute latest. It will be available for download from the second server. Yes, Massa, I said. Show sure enough. Cold silence. No chance of getting a laugh out of Mr. Bridge on that one. I trusted his assurances about the file. My handler at the U.S. Marshal Service was a serious man, and he rarely made promises on which he did not deliver. And even with the file being unaccountably late, I already knew the most important details. A person bound to labor had escaped. His service name was Jackdaw. His PIN was 78312-99. The company to which he owned service was a textile plantation called Garments of the Greater South, Pine Woods, Alabama, a Tuscaloosa suburb. A man had run. It was my job to find him. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I, this is the first time I've read aloud from this book. And I'll tell you, 
I mean, it's, it's weird. It's weird because I'm white. And, and, and I mean in specifically, specifically the experience of reading aloud. And not that I think that my character has a particularly quote unquote black voice, whatever the hell that is, but I do think that we don't often have the experience of having a novel read to us by its author. It's a very unusual circumstance. It'd be very strange if you bought a book and it came with the author coming to your house and reading it to you. But um, I guess the point of view character looks different than I do. And so it would takes an extra level of suspension disbelief while you're here in the room with me to believe that this man is who I have written him to be. But on the other hand, now that I think of it, he's also shorter than me, more physically powerful than I am, stronger than I am, smarter than I am. Um, so there are other differences as well. Um, the gentleman's question was, and it's a doozy, um, what kind of reaction were you expecting when you were writing the novel and how has the reaction been? Um, so, it's an interesting and complicated question. I appreciate it. Uh, the thing is that when I was writing it, I anticipated questions related to my writing from the point of view of an African American. And I anticipated questions about my um, writing about racism and slavery, writing a fiction, uh, a fiction, a novel about racism and slavery uh, as, a, as a white man. Uh, interestingly, the, um, the, I guess, the, the negative um, or concerned feedback that has actually, that has arrived has not been from those categories, or, or at least um, uh, not nearly uh, what I was fearing. Uh, what has come up um, uh, uh, is a, are questions about um, the, the, um, the sort of high profile that the novel got, right? That there was a uh, piece about me and about the book in the New York Times, uh, and the piece used words that sort of framed this book and my writing it as somehow um, like daring or like, uh, you know, I forget exactly what they said. And, um, you know, I think it was the headline writer, but it was also there was something of a tone of the piece of like, wow, look at this guy. Um, and that, I think, uh, combined with the fact that that piece um, didn't, in particular, make mention of Octavia Butler, who I'll get to in a second, but also um, some other authors um, who are African American, um, who have written about slavery in science fiction or speculative fiction context before. Um, there was a sense, I think, that sort of got, um, that this novel was perhaps claiming a um, a cultural position or a cultural sort of, uh, what's the word, like it was more original or unique or, or demanding to be read um, over and above other books. Um, and so in other words, it arrived in that way or was felt to be an act of cultural erasure, um, E-R-A-S-U-R-E, -E, erasure. Uh, and um, and the thing is, I think there were, there were some, and this a lot of this happened on Twitter, uh, you know, where things happen now. Um, and the, the thing is that there was, so there were, there were a lot of really valid points to be made here um, and some really important points to be made. And of course, you know, I, I found it really hard and boo-hoo, poor me, you know, like, like I'm so lucky, you know. I'm lucky uh, to have a novel published in the first place. I'm lucky uh, to be covered anywhere, you know, let alone the New York Times. Um, and I'm very aware as I hope was clear from my remarks before, um, of the um, the disparity and privilege that the the you know, just the fact of the skin that I wear, you know, the fact that I'm white in this country, um, saves me from a lot of grief that other people have to face, uh, be it um, be it uh, uh, police discrimination or incarceration rates or housing, banking, education discrimination. I mean, we, we we're aware of these issues, right? And I'm aware of these issues. And the thing is that these issues exist in my industry, in publishing. It's a really white industry. You know, it's, it's not a secret. Um, it's, a, it's a pernicious problem in publishing. The editors are white. The people who acquire books are, are white. And not 100%, and not but by and large, there's an institutional bias within publishing. So I don't know. Would I be where I am if I was a person of color? Of course, I can't know that, you know? But I found myself in this interesting, position 
of having written a novel about institutional racism, right? About the perniciousness of institutional racism and all of the ways that racism propagates itself and on its arrival, finding myself an example of that. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, uh, and what do you do, you know? And like, it's like, do I use my science fiction magical powers to go back in time and not write it? And I, and like, and like, and I mean that as half as a joke, but also like perhaps, you know, perhaps, um, but I, w I wouldn't because I stand behind my book. I believe in it, and I believe that the issues that are in the book are important, and I believe it's a, it's a good and powerful way of getting into them. But at the same time, I'm totally, I, I totally respect and understand the point of view that um, we don't do enough to make sure in publishing, in the media about publishing, that more voices aren't, that, that these voices aren't heard. You know what I mean? I, I just got a double negative in there, but I think you know what I mean. Um, that like, there, there is more that can be done, and so, my, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to your question, but this is, it's obviously something that's been on my mind since, since a long time, but specifically since the book arrived. Um, like, so what I have been trying to do in reaction to that is making sure that in public remarks I make and that in discussing the book and then in writing about the book, I do a better job of first of all, acknowledging that privilege that I just did to you, of my awareness that I, I have, um, that I'm privileged, right? That I'm white. And that that um, conveys certain advantages, not just in publishing, but in being, there are things that I don't have to wake up worrying about um, that uh, um, African Americans do, right? And not just police violence, although that's obviously high on the list and high on everybody's minds right now. Um, but also making sure that I acknowledge influences like Octavia Butler, um, who I'll just quickly say, so uh, some of the people always talk about appropriately in terms of the influences on this book, Philip K. Dix, The Man in the High Castle, and Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, but um, the other very important and um, the one that didn't go mentioned in some of those things I mentioned before was the book Kindred by Octavia Butler, which is from 1979. Um, and is, it's a time travel novel about slavery and it's incredibly powerful and it's like, it's like nothing else. It has this weird, beautiful tone and it uh, jumps back and forth um, between the present day or what was then the present day and slave times in a way that is like, I don't know, it's incredible. So, but, uh, and it, the book, that book has a long history of um, people feeling like it's not getting the credit that it's due, um, which this, uh, the reception of my book very much played into. Um, but there, and I could talk, I will talk more if you want about, um, about that book, but yeah, I mean, there are plenty of influences on this book that didn't, whatever, I'll, I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I've often heard that the two great alternative history themes are either what if the Axis won World War II and what if the Civil War was resolved in a different way? And you mentioned Kindred, and I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Um, I actually heard once Philip K. Dick was influenced by a novel that had to do with the Civil War, with the South continuing to be a separate country. I'm wondering if you've read other novels, alternative histories, that deal with the Civil War and with slavery. No, I haven't. Oh. Um, I. I uh, I'm aware of some, and I did the thing where when I was working on this book, I read a lot, and I'll be very happy to tell you more books that I read, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, when I became aware of other novels that specifically dealt with either the South winning the Civil War and slavery persisting, or the Civil War never having been fought and slavery persisting, I specifically crossed them off my list because it's a matter of reading things that are close enough in, in tone and subject matter to inspire and not so close that I feel like I'm working directly under their shadow. So for example, Kindred, while it's, it's a science fiction novel and it's about slavery, has such a different um, you know, uh, uh, theme that I could allow myself to be influenced and inspired by it. Similarly, um, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, which like, I had started that book before, I'm embarrassed to say, and not finished it, I think in college, but then I read it while I was writing this book and was totally mesmerized by it and sort of lived inside it for a couple of weeks. And I think I'm so, of all the things that have been written about this novel um, since it came out, the fact that people have said that it has elements of Invisible Man in it makes me 
sort of die with happiness. Um, because the, I think the theme that I found in that book that was really resonates with people about Invisible Man is the idea of the African American um, in American life feeling like he has to constantly be sort of either on the run or shifting identities in order to survive. Um, and I think I made this, th th this um, connection between that idea and the idea of a, a, a spy, an undercover agent, you know? Like, m my guy literally has to keep running and keep shifting identities in order to survive. Um, and I, I found that to be, like, this sort of spark. It was one of the sparks that really got me going on this book. Um, so the Ellison book, um, I, I can't talk about enough what that book meant to me, you know? And then also, like, but, like, Beloved by Toni Morrison, like, which is... Um, a magical realist family drama about slavery, like, which is also, in my opinion, one of the greatest American novels ever written. Like, it's not science fiction and it's not a, a thriller, but like, it, it, I, 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 I sort of soaked it up and hopefully there are things about, I don't know, I'm not gonna claim there are things about my book that are, you know, will remind people of Beloved, certainly, but it's sort of part of the, the idea world of this book too, also. I feel like I, I have no idea if I answered your question. I probably didn't, but there you are. Oh, and Walter Mosley. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's the, uh, uh, I'm thinking through now so, uh, more of the influences. And, and so Mosley, who is a crime novelist, a mystery novelist, um, and uh, Devil in a Blue Dress is this, is this incredible crime novel um, about uh, whatever. Easy Rollins solves crimes in, in South LA and he's black and the cops don't give a shit about stuff that happens in black neighborhoods so he solves these cases. But he's also, he's, um, Rollins is a, he's a philosopher. He's sort of a poet in his heart and so, and the book is all, well, I actually like the second one better. It's called A Red Death. It's even better than Devil in a Blue Dress although it doesn't get as much. Um, I read Race Matters yeah. as I was working on this book. I mean, I, I, I did, I read, um, I read a ton. I I, uh, I, I don't know. Um, it's weird with novelists because we don't all get together. There isn't there aren't like big novelist parties so much. But I I suspect to me the to me the really exciting and interesting part of writing a book is reading a lot of books. Like I think of it as like this funnel you're just pouring books into, and then and then your book is like this. You know, it comes out. It's, come, it's like a funnel. You know, it comes out. Um, and so I definitely I read a lot of. Um, African American, not not only fiction, it's some of the fiction works I've mentioned, but sort of essays and um, things like uh, uh, Race Matters, and uh, but also going back to like Baldwin and The Fire Next Time. And actually, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates had an uh, an essay in the Atlantic uh, called The Case for Reparations, um, which I read early on in writing this book, and it like that piece, which is basically him going, "Look, look, it wasn't like slavery ended way back here, and now we're here." It was saying there are all of these direct linkages. It's this lineage that you can see. You can see the way that it plays out over the generations. Um, the way of, of a redlining in um, real estate and, um, and these bank loans and uh, the, the incarceration of African Americans in the South in the you know, 20 and 30 years after the Civil War, that they're basically being re-enslaved. All of these things, um, we think, I think we, we too often think of slavery as this this ancient prehistory of America. This, it was this terrible thing that happened here. Notice the passive voice, it just happened here. It happened here a long time ago, but then it stopped. Whew. And here we are now, all these many years later. And what, what's, why is there all this racism? That's weird, you know? As if there aren't all of these direct, connect, as if the contemporary racism isn't the, the legacy of slavery. So it was, uh, the, um, that, that Coates essay in the Atlantic was something that for me was really illuminating um, in helping me sort of figure out what I was thinking about, you know, putting words to what were thoughts in my head. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you felt a difference writing about an African-American character versus a female character, since you're not female either. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm not. <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, for instance, I'm a writer too, and I have to write about men, and I actually prefer to write about characters who aren't like myself, because I find, by doing so, I found out more about myself. I think that's a really, that. really, yeah. So it's a two-part question, and it's the female thing, and then also, did, b through writing the character, do you feel like 
the character is also you in any way? Uh, yeah, I love that question. Um, it reminds me of something that when we were expecting our first child and someone was like, are you going to find out what it is? It's a boy, are you going to find out? And we, we decided not to. And I remember we had a friend who had also decided not to who said, ultimately, it's not, it's not the most interesting thing about this person who's about to exist, whether it's a boy or a girl. Like, ultimately, it's like it, it matters less than you think it does. And I think that that's true in general about these issues. Um, although I don't, um, I don't uh, diminish the differences between men and women or between whites and blacks in terms of the way that they live in society. So in other words, I think sort of in the abstract, they aren't that different, but because of the different um, things that they uh, uh, face, you know, the different um, problems they undergo, and I mean like women have to deal with more bullshit than men do in certain ways. I mean, and I think African Americans, as I've said now, in different in for contexts have to deal with more bullshit, pardon my language, than, um, than whites do. That those, th I don't diminish those things, but I do think that in both cases, it's a matter of finding out who this specific human being is. You know, like it, it took me, what took time was figuring out Victor's background and his voice and the way he saw the world, like his sort of cynicism and his um, relentlessness and his um, bravado and his intelligence, all those things, as opposed to sort of some abstract search for, well, what's a black person like? You know, how, what, what do, how do black people talk? How do black people think? Because that's not, if you've ever met more than one black person, you know that there is no, there's no solving for that, you know? And it, it's the same when I have in the past written female characters. Like, you very quickly get over the like, huh, how do I write having breasts? Like, that's like, that's not, uh, uh, that, you don't, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you write the person. You find what is essential about that human being in terms of their background, their conflicts, their wants, all the things that make for interesting characters. Um, but then, you know, th it, it may be that the conflicts that they face in the book, as is certainly so for Victor, um, and has been so for the female characters I've written before, the conflicts they face um, may have to do with the fact that they are African American or the fact that they're a woman. But their sort of essential um, personhood has to do with who they are, you know. And what was the other one? Yeah, um, I, th I am like him, despairing at times about the world, but then I also have that kind of, that hopefulness underneath it. He has much more reason to be despairing than I do, <laughs> um, but, I, but I, it's, it's, it's in there, you know. So I really enjoyed the last Policeman trilogy. That's how I came to know you. I haven't read your new book yet. Thank but, you. Um, was there any time that you were tempted to give us a happier ending? To the last Policeman books? Um, I feel like, well, I don't want to, I feel like it has a very happy ending. Um, you know, except for the asteroid. Uh, you know, I think that that book was always very much, it was, it the, the, you know, it's, it's a trilogy, but the whole thing was laid out in my mind, in, in terms of the, the big picture from the top, and that, and that um, it was about one guy growing up very quickly in the face of this, uh, this bad event, that, you know, that he was undergoing. So I feel like the happy ending in that book is like um, Hank Pallas going from boy to man over the course of 10 months, kind of. Uh, so no, that was, that was all pretty laid out from the top. Thank you. Thank you. I miss him. Uh, well, we've got like 15 more minutes here. Um, I'm going to read just one more quick passage, if that's okay, unless there are any more questions, because I like answering the questions too. As long as I have you all captive, I'm going to read just a little bit more. I mean, you're obviously not captive. You can leave if you want to. You, you all understand that. Okay. And this is just a short passage. So basically, we, we in the next couple chapters, we see Victor um, out in the field, and then he is, yeah, he's reflecting a little bit here. I had with me in Indianapolis all my usual equipment. Some of it was in my room at the Capital City Crossroads. Some of it was stashed in the trunk of the car. A variety of costume pieces, 
some wigs, some fake jewelry, and various basic elements of facial camouflage, a tube of spirit gum, a few shades of foundation, an eyebrow pencil. I had six different pairs of clear glass spectacles and six different sets of colored contact lenses. Other tools too, a set of picks and rakes for cracking locks, plus a backup set. Lanyards with name tags, fake badges and fake badge holders, clothes and shoes. My phone and its charger and its various accessories, the computer, paperwork for Jim Dirksen, and three more complete sets on three other names. All of it comprehensively backstopped. Every phone number connected to a real phone, a real person who knew what to say if somebody called. Cash, too, of course. Rolls of bills and rubber bands available for my use for incidental expenses, all of which were to be reported at the completion of each assignment. I had a gun, but it stayed in the hotel. Almost all the time, that's where I kept it. I am an undercover operative in a dangerous line of work, but understand that I am also an African-American male living in the United States of America. There are going to be checkpoints. I am going to get stopped. Every once in a while, I'm going to have to dump out my bag under the watchful eye of some kind of lawman. Sheriff's deputy, patrol officer, state trooper, what have you. Might just be some shopping center wage slave shithead rolling up on his Segway, flashing his costume shop tin, wanting to impress the girl at the sunglasses kiosk. When that sort of BS happened, I had no choice but to submit. I had no badge, no ID. I was true undercover right down the line. If you saw the way I traveled, if you went through my suitcase or the trunk of my car, you'd think I was a thief, some kind of con man. Which I was, of course. Really, that's exactly what I was. I was a thief. I was some kind of con man. Thank you very much. <laughs>